So, uh, Brother Steve, um, thank you for being here. We were really blessed this morning. In light of the, uh, the lecture that you gave this morning, which was about uh, Christians in the middle of the culture war, I wanted to start off by just mentioning that, uh, and, I, and you know this already, but recently we had the opportunity to vote for an amendment that would have placed some limitations uh, on abortion and would have regulated uh, abortion. And of course, Kansas voted in favor of uh, knocking the amendment down. And so I want to start off by asking, this is kind of in the category of, a, of being a square circle, but can a Christian be in favor of abortion, why or why not? Well, Christians can be wrong about many things, but, but Christians are not supposed to want to be wrong. Uh, we're interested in the truth. Uh, Jesus said, if you continue in my words, you are my disciples, indeed, you'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. So since we believe that there are true and false attitudes and, and beliefs about everything, really, we as Christians want to know the truth. We want to be on the side of the truth because God is and because we're on his side. Can a Christian be in favor of abortion? I suppose if they're ignorant enough not to know what abortion is. Uh, and frankly, you're young enough not to remember this, but there was a time when many people didn't realize what abortion is because they believed that a fetus, as they would say, in the early stages of pregnancy, was not really quite human. They believed it was more, uh, they referred to it as a tissue law, you know, and so when a, a person would get an abortion, sometimes they were of the opinion, it was a little bit like removing a, a mass or a tumor or something like that, and not so much killing a human being. Now, I don't know how anyone could have an excuse for thinking that anymore, because we know far more. I mean, ultrasounds, uh, you know, you can get an ultrasound, any pregnant woman can at any stage of pregnancy, you see, and see very clearly it's a baby from a very early stage. And even, frankly, even when it doesn't look very much like a baby, just in the very, very early stages, it sort of takes on the form of, not a blob, but of a growing organism, which clearly is a human organism, because that's, you can tell by the DNA, you know. I remember as late as the 80s, there were some people I knew, Christians who weren't sure if a, a baby in the womb was actually a living human being. But no one can really be, I mean, if there's anyone that ignorant of it now, they simply been like an ostrich, you know, with their head in the sand, paying no attention to the subject. Uh, any, I mean, my children, who are now in their late 30s, actually, we showed them films of, you know, ultrasounds of babies in the womb. And I mean, it's just always hard for me to think that any modern person doesn't know that that's a growing human being in there. If it's not human, it wouldn't have human DNA. And if it wasn't growing, or I should say living, it wouldn't be growing. So it's actually not a different species than a born baby. It's just a different stage of development. Human beings go through, from their conception, various stages of development, several of which take place before they leave the womb. Others continue after they left the womb. They go through infancy, you know, being toddlers and eventually adolescents and then mature and then old people. That's the stage I've reached now. And, uh, but it's the same person. It's not, it's not like every stage is a different creature. We have to decide, is this one a human? Is this one a human? Now, when is it a human? As soon as it has human DNA and starts growing, it's a living human being. And some people said, well, but the fetus can't be counted as having human rights like the rest of us because it can't survive, you know, outside the womb. Well, a three-month-old baby can't survive outside the womb either, womb without human, uh, you know, adult help. Actually, a five-year-old kid probably can't survive outside the womb without adult help. And uh, an adult human being can't live underwater without scuba gear or something like that, you know? I mean, the baby in the womb is underwater, so it has to have life support systems to make it uh, survive in that environment. 
Just like if I wanted to survive in the, uh, in the bottom of a swimming pool, I'd have to have someone pumping air to me. So that doesn't make me less human. I'm the same person, the same species, I'm just uh, in a different environment. So uh, once people know that, I don't see how a Christian could believe in abortion. But what I'm noticing, your arguments are coming from a biological, scientific perspective. Um, how about scripturally? Because Christians ultimately are claiming that they believe that the Bible is the word of God. So can you make a case from scripture? And the reason I say that is I heard someone just last week say that, well, the Bible seems to talk about life beginning at first breath. And the baby in the womb obviously has not experienced that. So even you Christians are not being consistent. I'm playing the role of a woke person. I don't have my blue hair dye, you know, but I'm just asking him directly. Well, if you want to ask the Bible, what, you know, what constitutes a living being, the Bible specifically says the life is in the blood. And uh, an infant in the womb has a circulatory system with its own blood. It's separate from its mother's blood. It has its own blood type in the first few weeks. And it has a beating heart within a few weeks. Now, even, even if it doesn't have a beating heart yet in the very early stages before it has organs, uh, to say that God doesn't see that as a human being because it's not, it's bloody, not bloody, would be a, a, a terrible thing to guess wrong. And that's the thing. Many people who are pro-abortion, they say, uh, we don't really know if that's counted to be a, a, a living human being or not. Well, then you better not mess with it. That's like saying, I don't know if it into that building, but I throw a hand grenade in there. And if the hand's in there, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know they were there. Well, if you know they could be, and you throw a hand grenade in the building and someone dies because you did so, that's negligent homicide. If you don't know if that's a baby in the womb or not, you better make sure you can be sure of it before you remove it. And no one can possibly be sure of it. Because defining a human person is, is like trying to define a woman today or to define marriage today. I mean, these are words that always had obvious meaning, but suddenly we're trying to make them mean nothing at all. It's not that people change the definition of marriage or a woman, they just don't have one. They've abandoned the definitions and they don't have a replacement. So what they've done is remove several key words from the human vocabulary without giving them any definition to replace them. Likewise, personhood. If there's a human being, well, we know a human being by its DNA. As soon as there's a zygote, it's got its own DNA. Within a few weeks, it's got its own blood, its own blood type, it's got a heart beating. And this is long before it looks very much like a person. So obviously the definition of a person in the womb isn't just related to how much like a person it looks. There's other factors that prove it to be a living human being. And if someone says, well, I don't know, I'm not so sure you're right about that. Okay, are you sure I'm wrong? If you're sure I'm wrong, do what you want. But if you're not sure I'm wrong, if you kill that thing, you are taking the risk of being a murderer. Now, does the Bible say anything about murder? I think it does. <laughs> A great deal. Now, but but if we could mention one or two of the arguments from the other side, uh, one of the things that you'd be told is, first of all, who are you, you rich white old man, to tell me what to do with my body? I think that I'm entitled to have an opinion about what everyone does with their body. For example if you uh, take your body and sleep with your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's husband. I think I'm entitled to have an opinion about whether that's a moral thing to do or not. I can't make you do the thing I think you should do, but I'm certainly entitled to have an opinion about the morality of it. Or whether you steal with your body, or whether you are a prostitute. I mean, there's, uh, whether you become a drug addict. Those are all things you do with your own body. But I certainly have an opinion about whether there's something Christians can do or not. And they're illegal too, by the way. You know, the, the, the government does regulate what we do with our bodies. And right. But of course, and the real like answer to your question, obviously, and I know you're expecting it, and, and it's right and so, it's not really the woman's body we're interested in this case. 
she already did something with her body. And that's why there's a baby there. Now, I realize some women have been raped. Right, that's going to be the next. Okay, some women have been raped and they didn't deliberately do anything with their body. But that's less than 1% of pregnancies that are terminated. Uh, abortion, if we say, well, I'm, you know, I, I can't be against abortion, because what about that, those few women who are raped? Well, would you be against abortion for all other cases? Most people would not go there. Right. You know, you know, they say, well, it's because some women are raped, I'm opposed to abortion. Okay, what about the 99% of women who were not raped, who got pregnant because of something they deliberately did with their body? I'm not telling them to do with their body. They, they told themselves what they were going to do with their body. And they did an act which they knew very well is the act that leads to pregnancies in some cases. It's like, they might have thought, well, it doesn't matter. It's true. If you take a revolver, put one bullet in a cylinder, and put up to him, you may not get shot. You're taking a risk. Mm. You know, if you're gonna play Russian roulette, there's a possibility you get shot. Can't blame it on the yourself. If you hadn't put the gun to your head, it wouldn't matter. Of course, you might have hoped that one of those five chambers was gonna be the one that came up. But you can't guarantee it. When people engage in sexual activity, as everyone knows, this is the way babies are made. Are they always made whenever you have sex? No. But you always take that risk. That's the gamble you take. And if you are playing Russian roulette and the, the wrong chamber happens to be in, in position, you blow your brains out, you, you're, you, know, you can't blame it on yourself. If you, if you engage in sex and you are hoping there won't be a pregnancy, but you get pregnant, oh, it's kind of the same situation. You took the risk and you gambled and, mm. and you lost. Now, that's what you did with your body. Now we've got another body to be concerned about. As we are concerned about the mother's rights and the father's rights, hopefully, of course, the abortion issue hardly ever is the father's rights. Many times the father doesn't want his baby killed, but the mother has all the rights to kill it without his approval, which is, of course, an injustice. But there's also the baby, of course. And when people when say, you know, don't mess with what I do with my body, I'll say, okay, do what you want with your body. The reason you're pregnant is because you already did what you want with your body in this case. Yeah. But, but, now there's another body, and you can't do everything you want with your child's body. I mean, she can make the same argument after the baby's born, it seems to me. This baby is like a leech, man. This baby is just like a parasite on my body. How can anyone tell me I have to feed this baby? Why can't I just sit outside and let it starve? You know? Well, because that, that's a person there. It's a person that you take responsibility for because you are responsible for its existence. And so, we're not trying to impose anything on women. If a woman has a baby in her room, she imposed that on herself. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing to, I mean, husbands and wives sometimes get pregnant and they don't necessarily want another baby. But having babies is not a bad thing, first of all. It can be very inconvenient. Uh, but then lots of things in life are inconvenient and the Bible does not encourage Christians to choose the path of greatest convenience. But the path of greatest righteousness. And right. nobody could imagine that abortion is in the path of greatest righteousness. You know, even abortion advocates, when, when you were young, you know, when I was young like you, I should say, when you were little, they used to argue for abortion to be safe and rare. Safe, legal, and rare. Yeah. Safe, legal, and rare. They always said, we don't, want, we don't want abuse of this thing, but we want it to be safe and legal and rare. Well, why? Why, if, if it's not morally wrong, why, why wish for it to be rare? If, if a baby is, you know, doesn't have any rights, there shouldn't be an objection at all. Can't be removed. I, I should clarify real quick, when he says that that was the song that was sang before, Safe, Legal, and Rare, we're talking about those on the left. Mm -hmm. This was their position. Mm -hmm. As recently as with Hillary Clinton, she was saying uh, safe, legal, and rare. I think it was Ronald Reagan who said, I've noticed that everybody who's opposed to abortion has already been born. <laughs> you know, I, and, and I've also heard, uh, I read in a quote somewhere, the way we Christians uh, phrase this is, the body inside your body is not your body. Mm, yeah. But um, what about when somebody tells you, uh, I mean, there's two men here discussing abortion. I think you've answered this already, but you know, when you're arguing with people on the left, 
you know, sometimes they'll quickly point out, like, look who, look who's talking about this. So what would you respond to that? Why is it irrelevant that it's two men talking about a situation that occurs to women? I don't, I don't really see how morality is related to who's talking about it. If, if abortion is immoral, then it's immoral in the sight of God, <clears throat> not just in the sight of two men or two white guys or, or any number of women, men or women. It's, if it's just two men or all men who are opposed to abortion and there's nothing more to be said about them, why should anyone pay attention to what we want? Even if 99% of women were opposed to it, we shouldn't even care about what they want. You know, what do they have to say about what any woman does with the baby or body? The question is whether God is in favor of it. Right. Now, now, men have as much right as women to address what God says. And sometimes men are more in a position to do so if they're pastors and so forth. But, of course, it's always potent when a woman gets up and speaks these abortions, especially if she's, for example, the product of a, of a botched abortion herself. Right. Or she's had an abortion or, you know, almost did. Uh, often the testimony of such a person is very poignant. But whether it's a... A woman or a man or I don't know who's talking about it. The question is, what does God think about it? Do, what do two men think about it or, or any number of men? If God <laughs> says that murder is wrong and if killing an innocent human being is murder, which is the very definition of murder, then the burden of proof is very heavy lying upon those who yeah, but the womb, the baby in the womb is not an innocent human being. Mm. We know we're killing it. There's no question about it. We're killing it. But is it an innocent human being? Well, it's hard to argue that it's a guilty human being. So the, the, the remaining question is, is it a human being? And by all definitions of human being that have ever been accepted, it is. Uh, to say, well, we're going to try to come up with a definition of human being, someone who's breathing. But what if somebody needs to be kept alive after an accident on um, oxygen, you know, because they can't breathe? Like that. Right. Are they a human being or not? No longer a human being. Right. That might depend on whether it's your wife, your child, your father, your mother, or does it just depend on whether they're a human being? People make emotional decisions about things when it affects somebody they love, but what about someone they don't love? Do they still have as much passion for the right to life? They should. God does. Absolutely. By the way, God's not a woman either. Okay? So, if only people with wounds can have an opinion about abortion, then God's not allowed to have an opinion. He doesn't have a wound, but he has an opinion about it. And that's, that's really good. Um, one of the things that, uh, that some people have mentioned, um, they'll say, well, what about the case of a death penalty? I mean, you hypocrites believe that abortion is so wrong, but then you're in favor, for those of us who are in favor, by the way, of death penalty, Look, look at the hypocrisy, look at the inconsistency there. What would you respond to that? I don't see where the inconsistency is perceived to be. Well, you're pro-life. I'm pro-justice. The killing of an innocent person is an injustice. The killing of a guilty person is often just. Not every crime deserves death, but some do. So if a person has committed a crime worthy of death, and there are crimes worthy of death, then for them to be executed is not an injustice. In fact, to release them on an innocent, innocent public would be an injustice, you know? Mm. To say, well, our jails are too full. This guy's killed three people, but we've had him in jail for you know, six months. Maybe we should let him out because we're kind of overcrowded here. That's the injustice. Right. Because there's people out there who are his victims. And uh, that's not just. When people do things worthy of death, the Bible says they should die. Even the Apostle Paul did that. In Acts chapter 25, Paul was on trial for his life, but he had done nothing wrong. And he said to the judge, he said, if I am a wrongdoer or have done anything worthy of death, I do not object to dying. But since none of these things they say against me are true, nobody's going to deliver into their hands. I, I killed a Caesar. So he was against wrongful killing but not rightful killing. He said, if I've done anything worthy of death and you execute me, I, have, I raise no objection. Uh, I cannot object to being put to death if I've done something worthy of death. Who can object to that? It's justice. Now, I 
I can't think of anything a baby in the womb could do that would make it worthy of death. It's of all innocent people, the most innocent of all. And if murder is the killing of an innocent party, that's part of the definition, then anyone who cares about justice would be against abortion. And most people who are in favor of justice would be pro capital punishment. Right. There's emotional reasons not to be favorable toward capital punishment. There's stories and things like that. Oh, this guy was on death row for 20 years, and finally, you know, before he died of natural causes, he came to Christ. And if they'd executed him, he would have, you know, gone to hell. And I went to heaven. Stories like that don't change the question of what justice is. We don't know that if this man was on death row, he wouldn't have repented sooner. I think a man who's on death row, if he's such a person as may repent, has many incentives to do so. Right. If his execution is looming. A man who won't repent before he's executed is not really the kind of person who's likely to right. sincerely repent. You know, the David Berkowitz, son of Sam, mm -hmm. kind of story. And the Apostle Paul does say that God has put a sword in the hand of the, of the government. Mm -hmm. right? So that could be seen as, well, the Bible does speak in favor of capital punishment, but it does speak against taking the life of an innocent baby in the womb. Mm -hmm. right? Or any, any innocent human being. See, I don't... I don't like to distinguish between an innocent baby in the womb and an innocent human anywhere else. They're the same thing. They're the same species. They're the same innocence. They're the same. They have the same human rights. Yeah. Uh, so, just uh, two or three um, more questions about this topic. And to be honest, it's a little bit embarrassing to even have to talk about this because, to me, it's just such an open and shut case. But I've been flabbergasted, honestly, recently to see so many so-called Christians, you two, uh, folks in, in churches and on Facebook and all over social media who have, who should know better, been following Christ and have been saying all sorts of things, you know, in favor of abortion. So what, what would... Which gets us back to your first question. Could yeah. a Christian be pro-abortion? They could be very ignorant and wrong. Right. And I believe there's many Christians who are ignorant they may be Christians in that they want to follow and obey Jesus, but they've remained ignorant as to what his will is about something. In a case like this, it hardly seems excusable. It's like Peter said, of this they are willingly ignorant. Right. I, I believe if a person is willingly ignorant because they don't want to know, right. well, then they're guilty because obviously they should be lovers of the truth. If they don't love truth and they're afraid of the responsibility that will come when they're learning the truth, so they hide from it, they go into the darkness instead of coming to the light. Their deeds are evil, as Jesus said. And I don't know that we can call such a person Christian for very long. <clears throat> for very long. That, that's, I think, a key phrase there. So maybe the way to answer it would say, would be, yes, a Christian can be pro-abortion, but not for long. Mm -hmm. Not if they're really Christian because they're pursuing truth. Kind of like somebody who thinks that God is okay with a gay lifestyle and they go to a pro-gay church, but if they're genuinely seeking God, God won't leave them in that situation for too long. But in the case of abortion, it seems quite a lot more obvious. Well, occasionally, I mean, eventually I should say, a true Christian is going to read a Bible if they have it. <clears throat> if they live in a part of the world that doesn't have Bibles, it's not translated in their language, they can't get one, then I think much more can be excused because they don't really know what the yeah. Bible says. They're kind of going on their hunches and their intuitions. But when we have Bibles, some of you, well, not many Christians read their Bibles. Well, shame on them. Why didn't they? Didn't they want to know the will of God? Right. Didn't they want to know what God has said? Or did they decide that they're Christians, but they don't care what God thinks about anything? How is that a Christian? I don't see, I, a Christian is a person who's passionately wanting to please God and follow Jesus Christ. How could a person have that passion and not eagerly be saying, God, what have you said? What do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? Give me instructions. I mean, a person has no passion for reading the Bible. How could we say they have a passion for God at all? Right. I don't know. I, I just don't understand that mentality. I understand people not caring about the Scripture if A, they don't care about God, and B, they don't maybe believe the Bible is the Word of God. Right. But, you know, they might love God and say, I don't, I don't read it because I don't think it's the Word of God. Well, these people then better do some more research because it's another case of remaining ignorant. Right. Unnecessarily. Anybody who wishes, there's plenty of research available online and many books that will demonstrate that the Bible is in fact the word of God. Right. 
no informed and objective person doubts that the Bible is real God. I've always said, and I believe this is true, anyone who's not a believer is either ignorant or dishonest. Yeah. Because if you don't know the Bible is true, you are ignorant of the evidence that's out there. Can you say that statement one more time? Because that's pretty inflammatory. And we could use this as a little sound bite to get some views. Say that once more, please. Anyone? Anyone who's not a believer is either ignorant or dishonest. Now, ignorance, no one has to be ashamed of being ignorant if they've had no opportunity to know the truth. Many Christians don't really have any idea what the evidence is, whether the Bible's true. They just they know that most people will reject it, and their teachers do, and the, and the influencers of society, they reject it, so maybe it's not true. On the other hand, they may not know that there's plenty of opportunity to find out if it's true. And if I love God and didn't know whether the Bible is true, the first thing I'd want to know is, is it? Because if it's not, I want nothing to do with it. Right. If it is true, I want to devour it. I want to master it. I want to know the mind of God because I love God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right. You'll do what I say. So if I love him, I'm going to want to know his commandments. Now, most people are indeed ignorant about whether the Bible is true or not. But it's unnecessary to be. They don't have to be, especially in this country. Especially here. Now, if someone is not ignorant, and they know what the evidence is, but they still reject the Bible, they're dishonest. Okay. Because they are applying a standard of truth to the evidence about the Bible, that they do not apply about anything else. In other words, if you had as much evidence for any other thing in the whole world as we have for the truthfulness of the Bible, you never reject it. But if you have the evidence that the Bible is true, and it's the one thing that that much evidence isn't going to sway, right. you know, you're just going to still say no. That's because you're dishonest. It's because you have a personal agenda. If it was any other subject that you had this evidence that you'd be overwhelmingly convinced. But there must be something inside saying, I cannot let this be true. Which is dishonest. That's why I said people are either ignorant or dishonest when they don't believe. And the Lord said, Why do you call me Lord? You say, Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I what I say, what I've commanded. And so one of the last questions in this little mini interview, uh, if I may ask, Steve, how did we get to this point? How did we get to the point where we have churches, and, and I don't mind saying this out loud, even though we have guests. You know, you should never correct your children before guests, right? But to be honest, I, you know, I've been kind of battling even in the church because I've got a, a handful of people that suddenly are, are irritated because of the public stance that I've taken with some of these issues. And, and I'm just amazed. And, and I'd like to ask you, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty big question, but how did the church, especially here in America, come to this spiritual shape that we're in where you can have people saying I want to go to church but I don't want to have a pastor that's going to or a preacher that's going to be taking a hard stance on certain moral issues and and think that even being LGBTQ plus being woke being this being that being pro-abortion is somehow compatible with being a follower of Jesus Christ how did we come to this? I Well I think we've come to it by preaching a uh, the wrong gospel. If you read what Jesus preached, you find him saying, unless you take up the cross daily, you cannot be my disciple. Unless you forsake all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. Right. If you don't for, deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. He said it would cost you everything sometimes. It may not, but it, it certainly can. And as you read the book of Acts about the early Christians time, these are the people who took Jesus seriously. Yeah. Apparently the preachers who converted him must have told them they're supposed to take Jesus seriously. Yeah. Now, somewhere in the last few hundred years, and especially in this country, or, or frankly in Western Europe too, the gospel, the gospel got changed. Mm -hmm. uh, it was discovered that if you tell people they have to forsake everything they have, church attendance dwindles. <laughs> right. And if church attendance dwindles, the offerings are small, the mortgage on the church is hard to pay for the pastor's salary. I mean, let's face it, let's be realistic here. We can't be driving people off like Jesus did. <laughs> Eat my flesh, drink my blood. He drove them away on purpose. Uh, 
and I mean, think about the rich young ruler. He was, he's your ideal church member. He was a ruler of the synagogue, and we have his own testament that he'd been an observant, obedient, law-abiding Jew since his childhood. He was also rich, but church doesn't want rich members. And he was publicly respectable. Someone had elected him to be the ruler of the synagogue. And he was zealous. He came running to Jesus saying, what must I do? To... I mean, this guy had zeal. He had, you know, good public image. He had more money. Life. Money, more. It's not going to scandalize the church. And Jesus said, well, you lack one thing. You give everything you have away. And the man didn't come. And Jesus didn't say, boy, I blew it with him. I should have been a little more delicate, you know. <laughs> but delicate is not a description of how Jesus preached. He knew that the gospel was a matter of life or death. We don't. We don't live in a generation that feels that obeying Jesus is a matter of life or death. Uh, Paul said, or Jude said, we just snatch people from the flames. From the fire, yeah. Most people don't feel like they're in flames. They're pretty comfortable. And we like to keep the gospel comfortable. And therefore, what the gospel is reduced to is a few basic steps for getting out of a damned position into a saved position, and saved we have interpreted to mean when you die you go to heaven. Mm -hmm. That's not how the Bible defines saved, by the way. You will never find anywhere in the Bible that defines being saved as going to heaven. Mm -hmm. Never. Not one time. Uh, and when the apostles preached in the book of Acts, when they preached the sinners, they never mentioned heaven or hell. They preached Jesus. They preached the Lordship of Jesus. They believed in heaven and hell, and so do I. But that's just not what they talked about. They didn't bribe people with heaven like a carrot on a stick to get them to you know, accept Jesus. And they didn't threaten them with hell. You just don't find it in their sermons at all. What they did say is Jesus is the Lord. God has set him in his right hand, given authority over all things. And by implication, what are you going to do about it? And so people had to decide, do I take the Lordship of Jesus seriously or not? That was the only decision they had to make. Yeah. It's not a, you know, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you're feeling convicted and you want me to pray for you, raise your hand. I won't tell anyone. Nobody's looking. You know, you won't have to confess Christ before men. We ain't why. Mm -hmm. And then when the next song is, all of you, we saw who you're coming You know, we're signing this, sign this uh, paper. Right, and preachers literally say, it. accept Jesus into your heart. Another thing that's not mentioned in the Bible, the reference to accepting Jesus in your heart is not a biblical phrase or concept. But we've changed the gospel. You, know, you want to go to heaven? Well, accept Jesus in your heart. What does that mean? Say this prayer. Is that all? That doesn't cost much. You mean I don't have to do anything else? I just get my ticket to heaven? Yes, that's what most preachers are preaching. So we've got churches full of people who care about one thing, and that's getting to heaven. But they've been told they don't have to do anything. They just have to say a prayer, and they did that, so they're in. Do they want to make sacrifices to promote the ways of God? Do they want to inconvenience themselves to live pleasing to God? Crucify the flesh. Many of them, they're not the slightest interest. So they've not been even told that they should. That's not the gospel that was preached to them. They've been preached another gospel different than Jesus and the apostles preached. Right. The American gospel. And so you say, how do we get here? Well, we started filling up churches with people who aren't converted. We filled the churches with people who were just looking to check the box that, okay, when I die, I'm going to heaven, but I'm still going to live for pleasure. I'm still going to live for convenience. I'm going to still live for money. I'm still going to live for Self. Popularity and so they have not been converted. Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. That's the first step. And that's the step that many people in church have never even thought about. Deny myself. I just said a sinner's prayer. My preacher said, that's all I need. In fact, I, I well, you're be myself. Yeah, and you're pre and I gotta be myself, live my truth, you know. And those preachers are going to answer to God for many souls. Who have a false security, who are not saved, but the preachers assure them that they are so they can sit in place in church. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Those who do the will of my Father in heaven. 
He said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name, we did mighty works in your name, and he said, I'm never, I never knew you, depart from me. Right. Now wait, these people are acting in Jesus' name, doing religious things. They certainly thought they were saved. And Jesus said, no, there's a lot of people, many will be in that category who think that, but he's gonna say, I never knew you, you're not a Christian. I don't know what you thought a Christian was, but it wasn't what you are. Depart from me. Now, I don't think Jesus ever said things like that just because he loved to hear the sound of his own voice. He said those things because they are urgently necessary for people to take seriously. So, this is how we got here. Yeah. If we preach the gospel that the apostles preached, Jesus preached, the churches might be a bit smaller, but they'd be filled with people who are Christians, right. not people who are false Christians. And... Christian, by definition, the Bible's definition of a Christian is a disciple. It says in Acts 11, 26, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So the first time the word Christian was used was describing people who are also called disciples. And Jesus said, if you continue in my words, you're my disciples. When he told the disciples, go and make disciples, he said, teach them to observe everything I've commanded. A disciple is someone who's being taught to obey everything Jesus said and is determined and eager to do so because they love him. And there are churches full of people who've never given it a thought. Never given it a thought to let Jesus be the Lord. Right. And, and if I may just say something, you know, uh, this is one of the signs that you can tell that you're dealing with somebody who genuinely wants to follow Christ. Are they willing to change their minds on the basis of learning what God has said? Because there's many conversations that you can have with somebody, whether it's on abortion, <coughs> abortion, LGBTQ+, plus, you name it, where even in the conversation where you can tell that you've, quote-unquote, won the argument, uh, for lack of a better expression, they still won't change. Mm -hmm. Even though they themselves have been convinced, yeah, you got me, what you're saying is biblical, but somehow I still don't want to change. You know, and they'll, they'll latch onto that. Mm -hmm. uh, reminds me of uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, great preacher from the 1800s. A group of young men came up to him after one of his sermons and said, we would give the world to preach like you preach. And he said, good, because that's what it's going to cost you. Mm -hmm. And I remember that. And C.S. Lewis also said, Jesus Christ is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. And so I think you really hit the, uh, the nail on the head with that. One more thing, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, well, two things. Number one, are you against the church growth movement? Are you against that? Because... Even in denominations, sometimes we're asked to, and I don't want you to bash any denominations particularly, but we're asked to keep an eye on how many new converts do you have, how many baptisms, and sometimes the number of people that come and stay or the number of people that leave a church is sometimes used to gauge uh, the effectiveness of your ministry. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, what advice would you give to even the ministers in this audience, ministers like me, and those that are watching the recording that are in this cultural battle and we're speaking the truth as we see it in the word of God and we're getting a pushback from fickle Christians. Well, the church growth movement, I think it arose in the late 70s as I recall. I never went to any of the conferences but I did read the things some of the leaders wrote and things. And basically church growth movement was a an attempt to get churches to grow big into mega churches. And uh, the size of a church was presumed to be a measure of its success, just like the size of a hamburger chain mm -hmm. is a measure of its success, or the size of a corporate, you know, a corporation is a measure of its success. The size of a church is considered to be its success. By that sense, Jesus was terribly unsuccessful in his lifetime. Because one day he had 5,000 uh, seekers, but he wasn't all that sensitive to seekers. Uh, he, he gave them hard words and they left. And the next day, his church apparently was about 12 people, down from over 5,000 the previous day. Now, if, if the church was seeking to fill a pulpit and hire a pastor, and Jesus or somebody came and they had a church of 5,000 and the preacher preached one Sunday 
and the next Sunday only 12 people came back. <laughs> they would not hire that pastor. Out of here. He was called out on it too, right? Jesus, they're leaving. Mm -hmm. And he even had to say to the 12, oh, will you leave also? And and when Peter said, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. I said, well, I, I chose you to tell me one of you is dead. So I mean, only 12 are left and one's not all in after all. <laughs> but Jesus is the king and the conqueror. He's, he's not unsuccessful. He just wasn't concerned about size as a first priority. Now, of course, he wants all people to be saved, so that if all were, that would make very large churches. But he didn't want his movement to be artificially inflated by people who were not really disciples. Jesus didn't have the slightest pressure to show that he was a successful preacher by having huge people following him, a huge number of people following him. He needed a few good men, and he got them, and they changed the world. And uh, I think modern preachers, many times, they are influenced by this idea that, well, the really big names in Christianity, the ones who write books that everyone buys, the ones who have the TV shows, the ones that their names are a household oh, word. Yes, yeah, they have their own jets and things like that. These are the ones who have huge congregations. And I, I think there's some pastors of smaller churches who have that, what I consider to be an entirely carnal desire to have a big congregation like that because their names will be well known. They'll be, you know, they'll be invited to speak at conferences and so forth. It's a measure of success in their profession. Right. But I don't believe being a preacher should be a profession. I believe it's a calling from God. Yeah. And I don't think it's something that you do in order to compete with others who do it, see if you can get more people than them. Uh, the, the church growth movement, the problem with it is, its objective is to make churches bigger. And pastors of smaller congregations go to these conferences to hear these really successful preachers, right. who are like David Cho or Paul Yogi Cho, who had the largest church in the world in Seoul, Korea, he would speak at these. Right. And you know, what pastor doesn't want to be the guy who's got the biggest church in the world? The next Rick Warren. Rick Warren or Bill Hybels or right. you know, Joel Osteen. Well, I think Bill Hybels later on then took back a lot of what he taught during the church growth movement. I believe he did. But church growth movement is in itself seeking to appeal to the more carnal element. For example, they said, if your pews, if your pews are three quarters full, you need a bigger building because people start to feel crowded if, if, they're, if, they're, if they're more full than that. If your parking lot is, you know, full before the service starts, uh, then you need a bigger parking lot. Why? I was, I went to a church, a small church initially, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. It was a... 300 people church strong now it's one of the biggest denominations in the world. Yeah. But during the Jesus movement, when there was only one Calvary chapel in Costa Mesa, California, we would park blocks down the street. They didn't even have a parking lot. We would park half a mile away because the cars were lining the streets to go. You don't need to make people comfortable to get them to come to church if they love God. And if the church is offering something that people who love God are hungry for. A lot of churches are not offering things that people who are hungry for God are hungry for because they're not presenting God, they're presenting self-help right. you know, talks, they're trying to coddle people, make people have feel comfortable. And that's not what people who are hungry for God are seeing. And interestingly enough, <clears throat> like if anybody sees a, a video of Chuck Smith, he's absolutely not flashy at all. In fact, I even asked myself, I wonder what the appeal was. There was no effort at all to appeal even to his generation. He, he was prematurely bald in his 40s and a little overweight. <clears throat> plain spoken. Plain spoken, never, never was dramatic, spoke very slowly, agonizingly slowly sometimes. <laughs> and yet he was, <clears throat> he was full of the love of God and he spoke the word of God faithfully. He did not try to promote the church. He was as shocked as everyone when his church became the biggest church around him. And then when they spawned thousands of other churches that many of which are many churches, which they did not seek to do. They, they just wanted to preach the word of God and people who were hungry for God Amen. came, came running. Yeah. And 
The church growth movement, again, is appealing to the wrong thing. Why aren't more people in this church? Well, it may be because we're not serving up what people are hungry for God want, or maybe not very many people in the area are hungry for God. If, if I were a pastor of a church and I'm not, I want to make sure that I'm serving up what people want who are hungry for God. Right. Then the people who are hungry for God can decide if they want to come here or if they get the same thing somewhere else. That's fine if they get it somewhere else. That's right. not my problem. I, I, it's not mine to build a big group. It's mine to be faithful and have Jesus say again, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Not well done, successful megachurch. Entrepreneur. Pastor. Entrepreneur pastor, right. So the church growth movement is focusing on size rather than on quality. Mm. And I think even before the church growth movement, this was unfortunately uh, uh, an ulterior motive yeah. in the minds of many preachers. We can get more people here if we water this down a little bit. If we preach like Jesus and the apostles did. Oh. Or the prophets. Yeah, Jeremiah. the prophets, yeah. How many, years in this how many disciples did Jeremiah have? One, two, what? He had uh, over 40 years of ministry. Yeah. Baruch. He spent his time in jail a lot. Yeah. But we remember him because he spoke the word of God in a way that for 2,700 years since then, people have been fed by what they had to say. And if a restaurant is serving the best food in town, people are going to come. Uh, if it's not, you can try all kinds of gimmicks and coupons and things like that to get people to try this, but people won't keep coming to start good food. Uh, so, there's a limited number of people in the population at any given time who are hungry for God and for His Word. Churches that feed them will probably attract them. Uh, if they don't, it's only because somewhere else nearby there's someone feeding them and maybe doing a better job. But, but that's not the preacher's problem. The problem is to be faithful, not to be successful. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. Well, we're going to, uh, wasn't that a great little interview there? Amen. We're going to enter a little time now of uh, Q&A. And the way we're going to do it is I'm going to start off... Um, let me see. Nobody sent me any questions yet. But we'll start off with one question from the audience, and then I'll look at my phone, see if anybody texted any questions, and then we'll go back and forth. If it's, it just becomes a little long and you have to go, God be with you. Amen. Just leave quietly, please, because we are recording. All right? So let's start off with questions from the audience. We only ask, you're welcome to disagree. Steve gets disagreements all the time on his radio program every day. The narrowpath.com. You should listen to it. So you're welcome to disagree, but don't preach. We've got enough preachers in the room. Keep it succinct, nice and brief, clear, nice and loud, so that the recording can pick up your voice. And let's launch it. First person with a question. Stephanie, go ahead. Sis. So I had someone recently, um, I talked to them in the last couple of days. And I just wanted to get your opinion on something that I commented on. Um, they own a business, and they were saying how they were talking to people from the neighborhood where they have a business about coming to church. And this person would stop her clients because this person would have like an hour's worth of questions about the Bible. And so I told this person, I go, that's great. I go, but I go, you're inviting them to church and they don't want to come. I go, you're sacrificing your time right now for your business when that person's not giving an effort to come to church. They're they're helping you and your business because they they found somebody that would answer questions. I go, but there's no effort on their part to go to church or to go to a church after you've invited them and they said they don't want to go to church. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know if maybe that was too harsh, um, like my opinion and what I gave, or if that person... Um, because they, they understood that they are losing clients because they're telling them, you know, come back in an hour and the clients aren't coming back. And so that's why I just was like, well, that person's not making an effort to go to church. And so I just wanted to kind of get your take on on if I was perhaps too harsh or, or what else I could have told that person. 
Well, there are Christians who view their business as an outreach and who are delighted to have somebody stop, even if they don't make as much money and lose some customers, if, they, if they've got someone who's a fish on the line that's a promising prospect who seems to be hungry for the things of God. I think a person who owns a business just has to make a decision. You know, is this, is this going to be what my business is for? Uh, is my business for making money that occasionally have to be flexible when this kind of thing is coming up? But if someone's coming every day or spending a lot of time and their business is starting to wane, you have to decide, does God want me to have this business be more of an outreach or more of a money maker? But the, the truth is you're bringing up a good point too. We should be eager to answer people's questions about the Bible. But there's a difference between someone who's merely curious on one hand and somebody who's hungry for the truth on the other. Uh, I have an atheist who calls my radio show from fairly frequently. And I don't sense that he's hungry for truth, though I do give him some time because I relish the opportunity to talk to an atheist about his questions. <coughs> I think his questions are more like intended to be kind of gotcha questions, like, you know, here's something that you Christians can't answer. Then when he finds out we can, uh, you know, he'll move along to something else. And he doesn't let it, the fact that an answer is given that is adequate, he doesn't translate that into the idea that, oh, now I've learned something, maybe Christianity is more credible than I thought. He just moves on to the next one. I was in Australia once teaching to a, a large group of young people about the authority of scripture, actually, and a young man came up to me afterwards to talk to me. He was a college student, not a Christian. He said he was an unbeliever. I said, well, why are you an unbeliever? He said, well, he says, I have, I have intellectual problems with the Bible. I said, well, I've got a few minutes. What, what are your problems? And he had one or two really objections that are kind of right out of the playbook of skeptics. I mean, questions uh, an intelligent Christian could answer right. relatively easily. Did the sun slip really stuff in midair? That kind of thing. The whole issue of miracles and things like that. Yeah. And so I, I addressed them. And I could tell as I addressed them, he was finding my answer to be reasonable. And after he'd gone, we'd gone through several questions. I said, okay, do you have any more questions? He says, no. I said, well, what do you think about what I shared with you? He said, well, that sounds reasonable. I said, so, uh, do you want to become a Christian? He said, no. I said, well, then you, you don't have intellectual questions and problems. Well, you, you just love your sin. He says, you know, I think you're right. And he left. Uh, he was curious, wondered what a Christian might say to this challenge or that challenge, but he was not looking for truth. And when Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine, what he meant was there are certain people who unflatteringly are likened to pigs, but who cannot appreciate the value of what you have to offer. A pearl is a valuable thing, but a pig has no way to has no appreciation of that. Right. And if you if you toss a pearl on a pig, for all he knows, you're throwing rocks at him. He doesn't know what it is, and he'll charge you. Jesus said, he'll turn on you and rend you. Uh, so there's a certain kind of person that you've got pearls you can provide, but they are a person who has no more appreciation for the value of what you have to say than a pig has for the value of a pearl. When you find that to be true, then I think you should decide you're wasting time with them until they decide they really want to know the truth for important reasons, like, like they want to follow the truth. So uh, your friend may have to evaluate those situations. Uh, once again, a lot of people would be delighted, a lot of Christians would like to have their business interrupted by somebody who's a sincere seeker, right? Uh, but not everyone who has a lot of questions this is a sincere seeker. Some are just curious. Some just want to talk. Just want to take up your time. Right. Right. Uh, Steve, we have a question from somebody who sent me this text. Do easy to read Bibles help or hinder the conviction of the teaching of Christ? I feel when I was young, it was more feared or what was being read out of the scriptures. Maybe there's like a typo in there, but it says, but what do I know? So basically, what do you think about these, uh, what he calls easy to read 
Bibles, do they hinder conviction at all? I personally don't prefer them, and some of them are an abomination, like the message, for example. Mm -hmm. Some are not an abomination, but I don't prefer them. I don't prefer the NIV. It's not a terrible translation. But Passion is a good one, too. Have you heard of that one? I've heard that the Passion is I've not read it, but I, I've heard there's objections to that, too. Um, Who said NIV? Well, the NIV, many of you, you might have the NIV, I don't know, but NIV is not a terrible translation. But there are, there are, you can do better. The NIV doesn't try to translate word for word, but thought for thought. I like a translation that deliberately intends to give you word for word translation from the original language. It's a little harder to read because one language doesn't have the same syntax, the same idioms, or even the same word order as another language. So if you just take a Greek manuscript from 2,000 years ago and give each Greek word its equivalent in English, it doesn't sound like an English sentence sometimes, not a modern one anyway. So an exact word-for-word -word translation is a little harder to read in the receptor language. Um, but I, I like a translation that does its best to keep the thought of every word in there. Uh, where some translations, the more modern ones, are geared to the less literate public that we have now. And they, they decide not to even attempt a word for word translation or anything close to it. They read this, the statement in the Greek and they say, now what is he trying to say? I'll just say the same thoughts in English. Well, that may indeed make those thoughts more accessible to somebody who isn't a, you know, isn't a diligent or studier. But what if the what if the transfer's thoughts are not perfectly true? I mean, many people, depending on their theology, give the same sentence a slightly different name. Right. And if the translator's not giving me the words of the text, but the thoughts as he understands them, then the translation is simply his commentary. And that's why we end up having a Calvinist who prefer one version as opposed to Arminian, mm -hmm. the ESV for the Calvinist, and so on and so forth. As soon as you move away from the word for word translation philosophy, you are now allowing the translator's own opinions right. to color the way that he restates something he finds in Scripture. And I don't want that kind of translation myself. Right. I want to think for myself. I don't want the transfer to do all my thinking for. Some people do not want to study color. In that case, an easy to understand translation may be better than none. Right. But to someone who really wants to study the Bible, they're going to want one that's as close to the original as possible, not as dumbed down as possible. Now, admittedly, we have a dumbed down public. We have a less literate public than we did a generation or two ago. And some people say, well, then we need to dumb down the Bible for them because we don't want them to miss out on it. Well, that's one solution. The other solution is to educate them. You know, people didn't get dumbed down because somehow mutations in the gray matter of human minds have caused brains that are less adequate for thinking. It's a problem with education. And frankly, modern education was an invention of Christianity. In, in Asia, in Africa, in most parts of the world, even in Europe, universities, schools were started by Christians because yeah. people were mostly illiterate and the Christians wanted them to be able to read the Bible. Yeah. So they taught people to read. And so education has always been the, a Christian, part of the Christian nation. I mean, you said go into the nations and teach them. That's educating them. Yeah. Uh, of course, you should teach them to observe everything I said. But the church has an educational role. And if I had, if I were a pastor of a church, for example, and, and there were people coming to the church who couldn't read well, I would do my best to uh, teach them to read. And if I didn't have the opportunity, I'd at least, I'd still use a real Bible. And then I would do my best to clarify it for their benefit in my comments. Rather than change the Bible, right. I'd rather send them home with a real Bible 
It really says what the Bible really says. And then in my teaching, try to clarify and, and educate them up to, for example, I mentioned different languages have different idioms. Okay, well, uh, we have the idiom in, in our in our culture of it's raining cats and dogs. Or I have a frog in my throat. These are idioms in our English language. In French, I believe they have an idiom that's sort of like our I have a frog in my throat, but it's I have a cat in my throat. That's actually the same has the same meaning, a different idiom in French. I have a cat in my throat. But suppose I was translating, or you were my French translator, and I clear my throat so I have a I have a frog in my throat. And you translate it literally, I have a frog in my throat in, in French, but they don't have that idiom. Yeah. They have to use their brain and say, oh, I... He, a cat. he meant a cat. Yeah, he literally doesn't have a real frog in his throat. He's probably, it probably means what we mean when we say a cat. Now it's, or he could just translate, I have a cat in my throat, even though I said I have a frog. I would rather have my very words translated and, and hope that people interested in understanding would be able to think a little bit for themselves and say, oh, okay, that's not literal. Right. We might say that this way. Other people would just rather have everything smoothed out artificially by the translator. And that's, that's a choice that people, I think, are entitled to make, as long as you're getting the, the truth across. But I think, uh, here's an example. Trans with the Bible translators, when they went down into some jungles in the Amazon, uh, they created the language for people and translated the Bible into their language. And, and when they came to something like, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The problem is the people in the jungle had never seen a lamb. They'd never seen a sheep. They had no sheep in, on their continent or in their, in their jungle. And so the translators had said, well, what do we do with this? Uh, they, they, that would mean nothing to them. Now, the translators realized that lambs in the Bible were sacrificial animals, so these natives actually sacrificed wild pigs. So now we can substitute this for Jesus is the wild pig that takes away the sins of the world, and we're getting across the same idea that he's a sacrifice. The problem is, though, what if that statement by John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the world, was not only referring to the sacrifice. Maybe there's other things about the Lamb in addition to their sacrificial value that correspond to Jesus. Right. As, as a sheep before his shears has done so, he opened not his mouth. Well, that wouldn't be true of a pig. What are you going to do? You're going to lose something in the translation. So what I think that some translators choose to do is they made up a word in, in the language for a sheep, a lamb, because the people didn't have one in there. They made it, they, they used it, and then they had a footnote that said a sheep is, or a lamb is, you know, a, a creature that was offered as sacrifices in the least that has these characteristics. In other words, translate it correctly, and then explain it separately. That's what I would prefer. It, it, it reminds me of uh, in, during the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, the Methodists in England, they didn't dumb down anything, but rather challenge society to come up to the level in which they were communicating. But for clarity's sake, uh, your issue, for example, with something like the NIV is not what I often hear. Well, they're taking things away from the NIV. I want to clarify that because we do have folks here. I don't use the NIV, but there's godly people here that do. And your issue is more with the thought for thought translation, because oftentimes I hear some folks who are more prone to conspiracy theories and say they remove something. But even when the NIV removes something, which I don't know if they remove like the, the end of Mark 16, for example, but whenever I do run to something, into something in the NIV, there's always something in the footnote that'll let you know. So there's no sinister motive behind this. You can see in the footnote, oh, er earlier manuscripts don't have this particular, you know, section. But that, is that accurate, right? If your issue is that is accurate in choosing, something. in choosing a translation of the Bible, you've got two issues. One is the translation philosophy, which is what we've been discussing. Right. Do the, do the translators believe in a word-for-word -word formal equivalence? Or do they believe in the thought for thought dynamic equivalent? Right. I like the formal equivalent. I like the word for it. That's one thing. Another issue is which manuscripts, manuscripts did they use for the New Testament? Because there's two groups of manuscripts of the New Testament. They differ from each other in some ways, not many. The one group is called the Textus Receptus. The other group we call the Alexandrian text. The Alexandrian text does have some verses left out. And out of some verses, there's a word or two left out once in a while. 
or as you mentioned, the end of Mark, there's like 12, 12 verses left out of the Alexander text. And so the question is not did the translators you know, in a sinister way right. decide to excise from the Bible certain verses, but did the manuscripts they were using have those verses right. and they were not? Now, the thing is, people say, well, it's, if they're that different, how can we know what the Word of God is? Well, it's not really a problem because, frankly, I... The Bibles that use the fuller manuscripts are the King James and the New King James, and no others anymore. The ones that use the Alexandrian text, which are ones with the fewer words and so forth, are the New American Standard, the NIV, the New Living Translation, the Holman Standard Version, the ESV. It doesn't matter. Almost any modern translation uses the Alexandrian text. But you're right. They put a footnote in there and say, some manuscripts include these words. They're not trying to hide anything from you. Right. And by the way, the, I mentioned the New American Standard, which I don't personally use very much, but it's a word for word translation, and it uses the Alexandrian text. Whereas the New King James is a word for word translation, but it uses the Texas Receptus. I've read through both of those versions, I've read through many versions of the Bible. There's not a dime's worth of difference in the doctrines in these Bibles. You know what I mean? Really? I don't own that enough for the first one, but a lot of the preachers I admire preach from the New American Standard. Mm -hmm. Bible. I use the King James. An example would be in the King James, you might find a statement in a verse that says, Our Lord Jesus Christ. And the same verse in the NHB might say, Just our Lord Jesus. And, and leave out the word Christ. Now, some of you see, it's a conspiracy to eliminate the fact that Jesus is Christ. No, the New American Standard that leaves that word out of that verse still includes it in hundreds of verses. You know? yeah. It's it's yeah. not like there's some conspiracy to remove something. And where it's out in the footnote, it'll say so. Like this isn't in the manuscripts that we're using. Steve, I got a, a, a question here that was text, and then we'll go back to the audience. But this is a really good one. Somebody was just listening to our conversation online about abortion, and they're basically asking. Uh, well, what is the church doing to support the women who are pregnant in what's called an unwanted pregnancy? And I think this ties into an accusation sometimes that's launched at us that says you fight for the children in the womb, but you don't care at all once they're born. How do you respond to that? The response is that the church does far more than anyone else does to help crisis pregnancy. Almost every crisis pregnancy center is run by Christians. Right. What is a crisis pregnancy center? The abortion clinics hate them because they just say, you're trying to deceive women uh, out of getting an abortion. No, crisis pregnancy centers do what, for example, Planned Parenthood, Parenthood doesn't do. They do more than abortion counseling. <laughs> they provide food, they provide diapers, they provide assistance, they provide counseling. Uh, they don't make a woman not get an abortion. If she gets an abortion, uh, for example, she has twins and she gets an abortion, one of the twins survives, they'll still help her. They're not going to send her to hell and say, sorry, you're an abortion you know, uh, recipient. Uh, Christians, not only toward women who have crisis pregnancies and babies, and Christians throughout the world do more to help poor and disadvantaged people than anyone in the world. I mean, Anyway, you, you can find surveys of this thing. You know, how much do these people give to charity? How much do these people? It's always the evangelical Christians give like more than twice as much. As, I mean, it's, it's a funny thing because <laughs> people who think they're compassionate, many you know, liberals, uh, they often give almost nothing to charity. I mean, when, when their records are shown from their tax records, it's many times these woke people who say, you know, we need to care for the poor, we need to care for these people. That you look at their tax records, they've given almost nothing at all to charity, where you pull out the records of even poor Christians. Right. And they've given, a lot of times, very poor Christians have given more to charity, charities that help babies, mothers, prisoners, students, you name it. Christians are equal opportunity assisters. We will assist everybody. And, you know, Planned Parenthood always says, well, we don't just do abortions, we do other things too. Yeah, like like open the door. Yeah, the exactly. And sit the <laughs> I think three percent of the services they provide are not abortion. Crisis pregnancy centers, and which are just one kind. They didn't call them that. What do they call them? Uh, pregnancy resource centers or something like that. I know that's a crisis. But I think they call them something. It's going to burn down. Mm -hmm. That's because they're doing too much good. 
they actually help women and babies. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> I mean, uh, the person who says you Christians don't care about the baby out of the womb. Well, really? How much do you know about what any given Christian is doing for babies? Out of the womb? How much do you know about how much money is given by any given Christian to charitable causes that help these people? And by the way, how much are you doing for them? You see, many people who say that, they don't do anything for the baby who are born. All they want to do is prevent the baby from being born. Right. And they consider that to be merciful. Right. I'm helping the mother not to become a mother. You know? And that's a merciful thing because being a mother is an awful thing. Yeah. Well, I don't we Christians don't think that being a mother is an awful thing. We think being a mother is a wonderful thing. And not just men think that. A lot of Christian women think that too. And uh, and again, it's what the Bible teaches. Right. And what society always acknowledged until like the day before yesterday. Right. Uh, and so we live in a society that has lost lost sight of right. reality. <clears throat> and someone who wants to kill a baby in the womb, and that's all they advocate for a woman who's got an unwanted pregnancy, they think they're the merciful ones. Right. But if, if your mercy requires killing one innocent person, in many cases to make convenient a life of someone who's not really very innocent. Again, you mentioned you want to ask me about the rape cases. We didn't actually talk about that, but <clears throat> we realize that some women who get pregnant are innocent. They didn't want to be pregnant. They didn't want to have sex, but they were raped. What should be done for them? Lots of things should be done for them, but making a murderous out of them isn't going to help them. Why, give, why leave them to do something that will give them a lifetime of regret? Uh, you mentioned your old grandmother. Before she was a Christian, had an abortion. She lived with regret about that until the day she died. <laughs> There may be people who get abortions and don't have regrets, but there's also people who, you know, murder innocent people, you know, in their homes and, and uh, don't feel any regrets either. It's called sociopaths. If a person kills an innocent person, especially a baby, and they feel no regrets, they're not a normal human being. They've got some serious defects in their character. Many times the regret that women feel after abortion is quiet, you know, uh, it's, and it's in fact silenced by this urge to shout your abortion. I'm proud of you know, my abortion. Carry signs, I got an abortion. I mean, me thinks they protest too much. Me think they're trying to silence a conscience by professing that they're proud of what they did. Yeah. And if they are proud of what they did, there's something of humanness that's been lost. And, and you, isn't the question a red herring really? Because even if every single Christian didn't care about the child after it's born, that does not in any way justify the killing of the child. That makes absolutely no sense. I don't know how certain people connect those dots. But uh, I think, did Dahlia, did you raise your hand? Yes. Hi. Um, oh, no. wait, we got a mic for you. Oh. My question is, uh, what's your opinion on um, DSM books, uh, manuals for uh, mental health disorders? They're coming up with so many recently, and you go to, you know, a clinical uh, person that has a license, and they have more, you know, diagnostics for you, um, and then they go and they treat them. And they well, they say this is these are your diagnoses, and this is what you have to take. Yeah, the DSM is the manual used by the whole mental health industry to decide what is and what is not a mental illness, and what you should call it if it is. And the whole idea of a mental illness is somewhat difficult to deal with because mental refers to the mind, whereas the brain is an organ of the body. The mind and the brain are not identical, although they're obviously connected. The brain is an organ that can get sick with a tumor, for example, or some kind of strange chemical imbalance or something like that. And it's sick and you can correct it. You can have, do surgery to get the tumor, maybe. You can maybe re readjust the chemical balance, just like you can in the blood of a diabetic or something else. I mean, there's physical issues causing the problem. Now, there's another category called mental illness, which is not connected 
to anything specifically physical. They often have said for the past 60 years that if people have, you know, manic depressive affective disorder, they've got a chemical imbalance in the brain. And if you've gone to a doctor and you're depressed or you're anxious, there's always been, you know, at least recently, pills they can give you that are supposed to make you feel better. They sometimes have terrible side effects, but if they do, they'll give you something else, see how that works. But the thing is, anxiety and depression are not really chemical issues. In fact, I don't know if you heard, but <clears throat> just last, uh, two weeks ago, a major study done by mental health hospitals in England came out and said, we've been wrong. There's actually no evidence that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance at all. That's been propaganda. It's propaganda from the pharmaceutical companies. Now, I don't want to give, I don't want to become the conspiracy theorist here, but let's face it, it doesn't take unusual cynicism to think that people in business want to make a lot of money. And the pharmaceutical business has made gazillions of dollars on convincing people that they have a chemical imbalance in the brain that this drug that they've created will address. And that this chemical imbalance has, is the cause of all their misery in life. Anxiety, anger, depression, confusion. Uh, just take a pill for that. Now, there is, a, there is good wisdom in taking a pill or a shot for, let's say, diabetes. Diabetes is actually a physical condition. You need insulin for that. If your pancreas doesn't create enough, you have to artificially supplement. Same thing with, say, uh, oh, any number of glandular issues where some kind of chemical is supposed to be produced in your body and it's not. You know, and, and you know, taking that chemical to supplement what your body normally needs is sensible, just like eating food to supplement hunger, which your body needs food, it needs nutrition. That's sensible. And there are people there are people who are miserable, even and mentally struggling because of physical issues, but they are not psychiatric issues. Uh, if you have, for example, hypoglycemia, and it causes you to be kind of nuts at times, as hypoglycemia sometimes has been on to do, well, that's a blood sugar problem, that's a chemical problem, some kind of dietary change or some kind of, you know, chemical uh, to redress it is probably going to help. But if you have schizophrenia, you know, uh, manic depressive, you know, affective disorder, uh, if you've got uh, most cases of anxiety and depression, so forth, there's no evidence that these are caused by physical causes. Some people say, well, it's confirmed by the fact that I took this chemical and it made me feel better. Yeah, there's a lot of chemicals you can do that will change the way you feel. It doesn't mean they're addressing an efficiency. If you got to get drunk, it'll make you feel different too. It might even make you feel better. But it doesn't mean your body is experiencing an alcohol deficiency. It's supplying something that's not natural to your body, but has an impact on your body. Now, <clears throat> uh, the DSM is the manual that psychiatrists and psychologists use to diagnose people's problems. And they can't even decide what's a sickness and what's not. Obviously, you know that what, until the 60s or 70s, right. homosexuality itself was listed as a mental disorder, as a mental illness. And it was removed because of political reasons, not because of scientific research. No new scientific research came along that said, these homosexual people, uh, no, they're not experiencing a mental illness. They're very normal. Well, what's normal what's not when it comes to things that aren't really health related is not really a medical decision to make. It's a sociological or religious decision to make. Um, you know, whether, whether homosexuality is normal, well, I'm sure for people who are homosexuals, it seems normal enough. They feel strongly about it. But whether it's, whether it's a normal way of life or not, or, or a deviant way of life, it's got to be decided not by medical concerns. If it was, if it was medical issue, they would have known it before it became politically incorrect to say so. Right. Now, of course, the whole 
gender dysphoria thing is it's still in the DSM. Gender dysphoria is still there for now. For now. But they would argue also that many people who are suffering gender dysphoria are normal people. They're just having discomfort with their feelings of, of the, the contrast between their biology and their uh, gender identity. But that's, that's because their gender identity is normal. And it's the discomfort they feel about this that's a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, but there's no real authority behind this. Of course, there are ways of life, ways of thinking, moods, uh, and so forth that are disordered ways of life. And as I said, some things can be caused by chemical imbalances, but those are not psychiatric issues, those are medical issues. What's a, you know, if a person has a thyroid imbalance, that can lead to misery and, and weird behavior in their life. That's a, a physical thing. Taking thyroid medication addresses a medical concern. That is medical. That's not psychiatric. Psychiatric is where you come up with all these names for moods and behaviors that are not found to be connected with any physiological cause. And oftentimes just reflect uh, the human condition. I don't want to lead you through a rabbit trail, but one of the issues I have with this topic, Steve, is that the mind is a metaphysical thing. How can a metaphysical thing be sick unless it, in a metaphorical sense? And I say that often and, and people push back on that, but I, I don't find any convincing evidence that... Well, the reason we disagree with terminology... Yeah, the reason we disagree with them is that there are people who are called naturalists or materialists. They don't believe there's anything outside of nature or anything outside the material realm. That means every human experience has to be explained by material reasons. Right. In other words, your thoughts, your personality, your beliefs, they're all simply generated by material processes in your brain. The neurons in your brain are firing a certain way, and these synapses are making you feel this way, or making you think this way, or making you believe this way. And it's just all caused by physical things. So the thing is, the cure has got to be physical too. They would not admit that there is any serious difference between the brain as a physical object right. and the mind, which is the functions of the brain, which is your opinions and your values and your beliefs and so forth. Uh, whereas we who are not materialists believe there's a God, believe that humans have a soul, right. that there's a part of us that's not strictly material, that God has in some way conjoined our physical organism with the soul that resides in it until we die. And that conjunction is very much tied with this organ called the brain. Because if you put a bullet through the brain and it still lives, it's going to affect the mind. If you put weird chemicals in your brain, it's going to affect the mind. So the brain and the mind are connected. Uh, but two brains that are equally good can come up, one can be much more uh, connected with reality in its beliefs, and another can be much more deceived. Um, one can have healthier attitudes than the other. It's not the brain itself, at least they have not shown that it is, and it's more of a philosophical conviction the brain. that the brain has got to explain the mind all the time. Whereas biblically, the soul explains the mind. Yeah. It is, of course, in a symbiotic relationship with the physical brain. And we and the whole mind-brain conundrum is actually uh, a study that any secular scientists are devoted to try to figure out, well, how are the mind and the brain connected? But, but the idea that the brain generates all yeah. bad moods, bad attitudes, yeah. bad beliefs, would suggest that it's a physical thing which has to be addressed not by education, not by repentance, not by faith, but simply by chemicals. Because your body is just a bag of chemicals. So if something's going wrong with the physical brain, you've got to find out what the chemical problem there and fix it with the chemical. And the, not the, the demonic has been ignored too. We've gotten mm -hmm. too sophisticated for that as well. And uh, so you wouldn't disagree with the idea that 
psychology probably belongs more in the category of philosophy as opposed to biology. Yeah, until until Sigmund Freud came along, psychiatry or psychology was in the category of philosophy. It was opinions about why people are the way they are. Sigmund Freud was a medical doctor and kind of the father of modern psychiatry, and he was an atheist, and he believed that everything had to be explained sexually, you know, sexually and, and physically and so forth. And so he kind of he kind of elevated the whole category of psychology into the realm of science, because he was a man of science. Uh, and from that time on, most people have thought of psychology as a science of the mind. Uh, but there are many, including non-Christian psychologists and psychiatrists, who are very much against this prevailing idea. They say, you can't have a mental illness because you can't have a, you know, an infected idea, you know, or something like that. I mean, right. it's a category error. Right. Well, uh, I'm looking at the time. Don't worry. Uh, we don't usually have this opportunity to have Steve with us. So we're just going to go on for a few more minutes, but we're going to try to encourage the the brothers to uh, send your text if you can. Somebody send a text that says, Ananias and Sapphira were struck down because they lied. Why did God do this when others did worse to Jesus himself and didn't get struck down? From a curious believer that I know. Well, for one thing, the people who killed Jesus were not Christians or professing to be Christians. And Ananias and Sapphira were in the church. They professed to be Christians and they pretended to be following Jesus. And for one thing, judgment is, begins in the house of God. But there's more to it than that because, of course, even many Christians have done worse things than what Ananias and Sapphira appears to have done. Why haven't we all been struck down? I think we can illustrate the comparison between that case and the case of Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron who offered strange fire. It was the first day that the tabernacle opened for, for business. They built it, they set it up, they dedicated it. The Holy Spirit came in a pillar of cloud and it was open for the first day for the first sacrifices. And there's only four priests. There's a high priest and his four sons. And two of them get struck dead by God the first day the tabernacle was in operation. What had they done wrong? Well, they were supposed to take some coals from this altar over here that God had supernaturally ignited and burn incense in the tabernacle with these coals. For some reason that's not explained, they decided not to do it quite that way. They had access to some other coals that these would do. Incense burns just as well with these coals as with these. All we got to do is burn incense, right? So they got different coals, did not follow God's instruction. They went and burned incense in the tabernacle and fire from God came out and destroyed them. And while Moses and Aaron were standing there stunned, God said to Moses, I will be regarded as holy by those who come to me. And basically he said, I'm not like other alleged gods. I'm not like anyone else. When I tell you to do it, do it. When I say do it this way, do it this way. You don't monkey with this. You have direct instructions from God, and God's not like anybody else. When he gives instructions, you do what he said or face consequences. It seemed like a very small infraction, just like Ananias and Sapphira say, well, we're giving all of our goods to help the poor, but really secretly they have to take some of it for themselves. I mean, that's at least they gave. You know, I mean, why, why were they so bad with that? A little white lie to the Holy Spirit. When you're dealing with the Holy Spirit, it's not a minor issue. Just like when you're bringing sacrifices before Yahweh, it's not a minor issue. Uh, God demands complete honesty. Now, many priests after Nadab and Abihu did many worse things. Priests crucified Christ. And many of the priests before Christ were very corrupt people, did horrible things. Uh, but God didn't strike them down. Many people have done worse things than Ananias and Sapphira did, and God has struck them down. What's up with that? Well, I believe it's this. God, if he went around striking down everyone who committed a sin as soon as they did it, would soon uh, we'd have a vacant planet. 
And that's not his purpose. It says, for example, in Ecclesiastes 8, 13, because the judgment against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. Because God doesn't always strike people instantly. But the fact that he doesn't do it instantly doesn't mean that he's not paying attention. Right. Doesn't mean that he's more tolerant of it. It doesn't mean that he's not going to judge for it. He just not. He doesn't have to judge instantly. When he judged Nathan and Abihu, and later in the last inspired, this was at the very beginning, the beginning of the temple system in the first case, and the beginning of the church in the second case. And God says, "I'm going to set a precedent here. I'm not going to do this every time people do this, but I'm going to do it the first time, and then I will set a precedent. You'll know exactly." What I think about this, you'll know exactly how seriously I take this. And if I don't do it to you, <clears throat> immediately when you do these things, don't think that I don't feel the same way about it when you do it, and that you're going to have to answer me for it. I'm just, you know, I'm just not going to strike everyone down instantly. But I'll set an example, and this example should inform everyone that comes on after. Uh, if they don't, if they don't heed it. And those who don't hear don't get struck down immediately. That doesn't mean they're not going to be struck down somewhere, or that God's going to give them a pass. Uh, you're supposed to keep in mind, God gave us this example, this example defined for us. You know, God's intolerance for that kind of thing. And it worked because the passage says that fear spread throughout the whole church. Mm -hmm. So that makes perfect sense. Cheryl had a question. Oh, she's helping. She's helping some folks exit. Uh, well, do, in the meantime, do we have? Oh, she's coming right back. Cheryl, Hi. you had a question. Yeah, um, going back to the easy read Bible question. Um, what about for those that have reading comprehension problems and, like the NIV, which is what I read, is easier for us to understand. Well, like I said, reading an easy to read translation is better than reading nothing. Now, if people have a hard time with reading comprehension, they're probably not going to read a Bible that's not, not easily comprehended. And that being so, you know, the best Bible is the one you'll read, <laughs> as opposed to the one you won't read. But when I'm asked about my opinion on which Bibles are preferred, I prefer a Bible that's more accurate. I, you know, a translation can be more or less accurate. I like a more accurate version than a less accurate version, but that's that's me. I don't have particular problems in reading comprehension, but I will say this. I never was a good reader. I'm still a very slow reader. I've read, I think, many hundreds of books now, very slowly, because I'm not a fast reader. I got through high school without having read a whole book through. I mean, I just always thought myself was not a very good reader. But when I got into reading the Bible, I wanted to know it. I just wanted to know it. I spent all my time immersing myself in it. Yeah, there's a lot I didn't understand. And I was a slow reader, but I didn't have a whole variety of Bible. Back then, the NIV didn't exist. Back then, you know, the Living Bible didn't even exist. But I just thought, well, this is the Bible I have. This is what I'm going to read. Uh, if things are hard to understand, I'll just have to be harder about them. Now there are options. And, you know, a person who's not going to read a harder Bible may be better off having an easier to read Bible. Right. Good, good answer. Uh, questions from the audience? Anybody? Yes, sir. The brother right here in the front. They're bringing the mic to you. <laughs> It's about Easter. So we call uh, Good Friday and then Risen Sunday. And the Bible teaches that Jesus was in the part of the earth three days. So this doesn't square up it's from 73 hours to Friday and Sunday morning. Yes. <coughs> A valid question. Jesus was crucified, at least traditionally, we believe he was crucified on Friday late in the day therefore he spent a few hours on friday and friday night in the tomb then the whole of saturday 
and Saturday night in the tomb, and then maybe a little tiny bit of Sunday before he rose. That's technically two nights and one whole day and little parts of two other days. And yet, Jesus said in Matthew 12, 40, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. Uh, and, and, and Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. How do you get three days and three nights if you're between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning? You don't. You can't get three days and three nights out of it. The most you can get is two nights and parts of three days. So, how do you understand that? Well, some people have argued that Jesus was crucified on Thursday, and others have said he was crucified on Wednesday. These people have a number of arguments. It's, they are credible arguments, but they're not totally persuasive arguments. There are people who want to place the crucifixion of Jesus on Wednesday or Thursday because then they can find a way to fit three days and three nights entirely in between. Now, say on Wednesday, wouldn't that be too long? Well, they would say he was crucified Wednesday, but rose Saturday night, but his empty tomb wasn't found until the next morning. So, that's one solution. The solution I've always accepted is based on the fact that the Jews had certain idioms, as we're talking about idioms that are different in one language from another, that they used. And we know they use them because they're found numerous times in Hebrew literature. And that is, and, and this is strange to us. We, I can't figure out why they did this, but this is what they did. When they were talking about a series of days, any part of a day in that series was called a day and a night. Why? I don't know. For example, archaeologists have found medical records from that period where it is said that somebody has uh, is quarantined for five days and five nights. But when the actual days are enumerated, it's really three whole days and a little bit of, of you know, a little day of uh, day before the first goes and a part of the day afterwards, and they call it five days and five nights, when it's really just parts of five days. <coughs> That's the way they spoke. So, when Jesus said three days and three nights, his audience were Jewish, would have understood that very non-literally. They would have understood it idiomatically. He's going to be at least parts of three days in the tomb, which, speaking Jewishly, which could be said three days and three nights. Now, if we did make this crucifixion on Thursday or Wednesday, we could get literally three days and three nights. There'd be nothing wrong with that, but we've got another problem we'd have to deal with. Because there's only that one time in Matthew 12, 40, where it says three days and three nights, but three other times, Jesus spoke about his death, and he said he'd rise on the third day. Now, if he was three days and three nights in the tomb and then rose, it would be the fourth day. Because three whole 24 hour periods would have passed, and it'd be after that, it'd be the fourth day, not the third. Three times he told his disciples, I'll rise on the third day. Even after the event, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 said that Jesus rose on the third day. It's a, you know, it's a universal teaching of the New Testament. Jesus rose on the third day which seems would be impossible if he was literally a full three days and three nights in the tomb, then you've used up the first, second, and the third day before it happened, so you're in the fourth day. So I'm inclined to believe the Friday crucifixion is, is legitimate. He was in the tomb part of Friday, all of Saturday, a little part of Sunday. To a Jewish speaker, that could be referred to as three days and three nights although it's not a literal way of speaking. But when Jesus said he'll rise on the third day, that would be a more literal statement. And again, that's the statement that's made more frequently. <laughs> and this is great. We, we have time for maybe two more questions. Anyone here in the front on this side? No? Dahlia then? Yes? Another one? I'm sorry, yes. Nobody uh, raise their hands. I don't to, apologize. we got to fill the time. It has <laughs> to do with time. Uh, I want to go back to Joshua chapter 10. 
Um, it says, so the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. Uh, they were in war at the time and, uh, you know, the Lord just froze uh, the daylight for a while. I've heard, uh, you could say, I think it's a theory of, oh, it was a time of leap year or it was in February and it has a mathematical explanation. What would you say to that? I got an explanation several years ago from a guy named Ralph Woodrow who argued that from the Hebrew statements, it does not necessarily mean that the sun stood still. He gave some other meaning. He was a Bible believer. He was trying to solve that problem. Uh, and it seemed like he was trying to give a, liter a legitimate solution to it. And, but I, I didn't find it persuasive. But part of it is I didn't quite understand his argument either. He's arguing from some special meanings of some of the Hebrew words and things that I was, it was over my head. Uh, so I never actually learned what he was saying so as to be able to evaluate his correctness or not. But one of the reasons I didn't is I didn't feel a need to. Many miracles in the Bible, there are people who give a, a natural explanation for them. You know, Jesus didn't really walk on water. It just looked like he was because there's a reef just below the surface of the water. <laughs> He's walking on it and the disciples thought he was walking on water. He didn't really feed 5,000 with, you know, two fish and five loaves, or, or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, he, this boy shared his lunch, and all the people who've been hoarding food without even knowing were moved <laughs> by this boy's generation and inspired to bring out their food so everyone had enough food. <laughs> Every miracle to them, they can explain it away. Uh, now, by the way, I, I heard in Cuba that... Uh, it wasn't God who not supernaturally knocked down the walls of Jericho, but the marching created vibrations <laughs> that tumbled the walls. Of course, that wouldn't explain Must how Rahab's little piece of wall yeah. survived. Must but have been a very fragile fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, no. but lots of people want to remove miracles and explain them away, uh, which is, to my mind, very unnecessary. Now, those who mock the idea that the sun stood still, they say, don't you realize back then they thought the sun was moving? But now we know it's the earth that's moving. The sun only appears to be moving. The earth is actually spinning at a thousand miles an hour at the equator. Do you realize that for the earth to suddenly screech to a halt, every tree would fall over, every mountain would go sliding across the continent, there'd be tidal waves over the whole earth? My answer is, I do know the earth is spinning, and I do know that if the earth came to a screeching halt, the laws of nature would tend to make all those disasters happen. I have a, a, you know, I don't claim to know exactly how it happened. I would say this, the Bible doesn't say it came to a screeching halt. If I'm going 100 miles an hour on the freeway and I see that there's a policeman up the way, I can slow down to 45, not instantly, I go through the windshield. <laughs> Give me a few minutes, or even half a minute, and I can slow down pretty well. I'm sure that if God brought the earth to a gradual stop, briefly, and that sounds even ridiculous anyway to people who don't believe God can do such things, but I suppose it could be gradual enough that everything didn't have to fall over. Uh, yeah, if you slam, if, if a person's going 100 miles an hour and hit a brick wall and they stop suddenly, the windshield is history, you know, and so is the car and the person. But things can happen gradually, too, less disastrous. However, I am of the opinion that God is able to do everything. And if He knows that stopping the earth is going to cause the oceans to splash over the continents and mountains to fall and trees to keel over. You know, every every animal's gonna slide off into the nearest lake or whatever. <laughs> I think the same God who could stop the earth from spinning if he wishes can also hold everything in place if he wishes. Right. 
I, I'm not saying that's what he did. I'm just saying I have no problem believing he could do that. The Bible does not explain how he did the thing. It just says he did. I don't know how he did many of the things he did. But I'm kind of like a child when it comes to God. He knows so much more Amen. than everybody else knows combined. In fact, Paul said the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. The smartest people are fools compared to God. So for us to try to second guess, could God really pull this off? Now, could he do this without destroying everything? I guess my answer would be, if he wants to, if he wants to, if he has reason to, he can do whatever he wants to. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't have a problem with it. Me too. Right? Um, with, well, it's 7 o'clock, and we're going to bring the event to a close, but we have time for one last question. I see one hand there. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So this is kind of like a two-part question. Um, the Bible talks about the Bible. talks about how, you know, he describes, you know, this creature that he creates. We've explored more of our outer space than we have our waters. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that there are creatures in the, in the ocean that, that are thousands of years old that God has created and we've just, they've just been in the deepest parts of the ocean, um, you know, we've yet to discover them. And then the other part is, do you think that there are other beings out there? Is there anything biblical that says that there are other humans out there or anything else out there? It is my personal belief that I feel that there are just because God created galaxies and stars and we can admire them from here. I think that there are beings out there that can admire his works that he's created. I think what was it about in the last month and a half, there were some images that came out of some galaxies that existed out there, you know, that we have never been able to see before. But I think that there are beings out there that can admire his handiwork. So I just kind of wanted to ask what your take on that is. The congregation here has long suspected that I'm um, an extraterrestrial. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a reptilian? <laughs> a shape shifting reptile? As far as creatures unknown to man, there certainly are. I mean, there's plants and animals that are still being discovered all the time, especially plants. But it is said we know more about the dark side of the moon than we know about the ocean bottom. The oceans are so deep in certain places that it's entirely inhospitable for us, even with our technology, to get that deep. Yeah. Uh, though from time to time something from there emerges, and we do get a sight of it, and there's some pretty strange beasts down there. Back in 19, uh, I was thinking it was 76, Time Magazine uh, had a picture of a Japanese trawler that pulled up in its nets a decaying mass of a creature that was like 30 feet long, it was a reptile. It was dead, of course, but it looked very much like a plesiosaur. It had not been fossilized, it had not been frozen in ice. It was recently dead and just decaying. How, how deep in the ocean it usually lived, so that it had never been spotted one alive, who can say? We don't know. There are actually parts of jungles in Africa that have not really been uh, thoroughly explored by modern men. In some cases, the natives have rumors about very large creatures that make elephants seem dwarf by comparison in those jungles. Uh, there used to be a guy on the radio named uh, Paul Harvey. Some of you remember Paul Harvey? <laughs> Good name. And he, he reported once that a team of American explorers went into an African jungle where these sightings were recorded to see if they could photograph anything like a dinosaur. Movie. I remember when the news report came across, I know where I was at the time when I heard it, I specifically remember. And then a month or so afterwards, I heard a follow-up report that said these people had come out. They had photographed some things. They said they did see what they believe was a dinosaur. But the, 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 the dampness of the swamp, the humidity, it ruined their camera equipment. They didn't bring anything out useful. And they were planning to go back in and you know, get some kind of more 
durable equipment or something. Now, I don't, I don't claim that this is true. I, I just know it was in the news. Secular news. I don't know if there's dinosaurs in there or not, but certainly in the in the oceans there are things we don't know yet. As far as out in outer space, anyone's guess. Um, obviously, some people try to say that the Bible makes reference to UFOs. They especially are fond of using Ezekiel's vision in chapter one of Ezekiel, where he saw uh, what what is described as the throne of God being carried on a chariot with all these strange creatures at the forefront of the chariot and so forth. And people say, oh, I think that, that, I think that was a, a UFO. Well, it would be an unidentified flying object, if not for the fact that it was identified. And uh, an identified object cannot be unidentified. So <laughs> it's not a UFO, it's, it was the throne of God seen in a vision. Are there life in other planets? There could be. I mean, I'm. If they discovered that there were, I, I just add to my knowledge. It wouldn't shake up my knowledge. I personally have doubts, not because of my biblical convictions, although that would perhaps lead me that way too, but because they say that this planet, in this particular solar system, in this particular part of the universe, is incredibly privileged by what they call fine-tuning. There's a whole bunch of laws of physics that have to be adjusted just right down to, you know, a millionth of a percentage point that if they were off, no carbon-based life could exist here. This has been so startling that one of the America's leading atheists who, who was frankly considered the most respected atheist philosopher in America for 50 years, Anthony Flew, he became a believer in God. Not in, he didn't become a Christian, but before he died, he became a believer in God. He would have said, there is a God. He'd been saying there is, he'd been debating Christians. Yeah. And he said, there's a God. This could not have been made. And one of the things that influenced him was this fine tuning thing. Many other uh, scientists have been really shaken by it. And, and, and it's led people who don't believe in God to say, this truly does seem impossible. But they've invented a theory called the multiverse where they say, well, our universe is not the only one, perhaps. There may be an almost infinite number of universes, and each one evolves separately with its own set of characteristics. And if there's an infinite number of evolving universes, one of them is bound to have this particularly uh, harmonious collection of physical qualities. So it's not so surprising. We just happen to be the lucky ones. Or unlucky, as one might understand it. But the point here is that they've invented a multiverse, which they admit no one will ever observe because we can only observe ours. Right. They don't expect to ever prove there's a multiverse. It's a theory they came up with because they couldn't explain the fine tuning yeah. without it. And, and it's unfalsifiable. It's unfalsifiable. So this phenomenon of the fine tuning makes it seem very unlikely that what we would recognize as life, carbon-based life at all, uh, could really exist anywhere else. Of course, you're like, why do you got to make all these galaxies and stuff way out there where only now, with specialized equipment, we can even know they're there? God might like surprises. He, the Bible says he made the stars to give light on the earth in Genesis 1. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't other planets that, that they're giving light to as well. There could be. But as far as God wants us to know, and I, I think the Bible gives us information on a need-to-know basis. What we need to know is the reason we see stars in the sky, the reason we live in the world we do is because God focused on life on this planet to be the one place where he had creatures made in his own image, where he even sent his son and became one of us. Amen. Now some people say, well, isn't that very arrogant? For, for us to say that we little ant-like, bug-like creatures in the universe, are the all it's all there for us? Well, if I made it up, I guess it'd be pretty arrogant. I didn't make it up. They said, but the Earth is so small, how can it even be significant? Well, since when is size the determiner of significance? Would you rather swallow a, a marble or a virus? One's almost infinitely larger than the other. 
But a virus is far more significant than a marble. Uh, an elephant's much larger than a man, but a man's more significant. How big would the earth have to be in order for them to think it's significant? If it was a gazillion times larger than that, we'd still be a speck in the earth. It doesn't matter what size the earth is, its significance is based on God's purpose for it. Does he have a similar purpose for other planets out there and other creatures? Possibly. It certainly can't be ruled out until we are told otherwise. But, and you know, it may be that creatures from other galaxies will arrive here and will discover they are there. And some people feel they've already been discovered, and many people think there have been encounters with them. I, I'm not fully persuaded, but maybe I could be. If I was one of the ones who had one of those encounters, I could be, perhaps. But I don't care that much. I don't see how it impacts the way I live my life, day by day. I know what God wants me to do, and that won't change if I find out there's you know, that Mars, on the far side of Mars, there's a population of creatures we've never discovered. That would certainly be a point of interest, but not a very practical point for my life, and I won't claim that I wouldn't be interested, but I'm not interested enough to focus on it. Right. Well, Steve, uh, the very first person who sent me a text, I accidentally overlooked it. So this is the last, last one, I promise, everyone. And we can leave it to in here. This is the last one, and I'll cut him off if he goes over an hour. Uh, somebody said, we always blame the devil for all our bad decisions. I'm not defending the devil by no means, but how much is that true? And how much is, is really our fault? It's all our fault. Adam and Eve made a very bad decision. It was entirely their fault. Did the devil deceive them? Yes, but they know it's Jesus for being deceived. God told them the truth. The devil told a lie. They couldn't believe God and said the devil. That was up to them. In fact, that's what was the very test they were facing. That's why God put the devil there to test them. He told them the truth. The devil told a lie. Now they're being tested. Will we believe God or will we think God lied? I believe this snake. Well, they made the wrong choice. Was the devil involved? Of course, he's the tempter. He's the tester. He's the deceiver. But no one has to be deceived if the truth is available to them. Amen. So, whenever we sin in our thought, word, or deed, whenever we're mistaken on something that God, the word would have corrected, if we'd only believed it, we can't blame the devil for that, but we can't say he wasn't involved. If somebody comes and tells lies to you, tries to deceive you, shame on them. But if you believe them, shame on you. Amen. Thank you all so much for having spent this evening with us. I intentionally wanted to end with a little comment that uh, a dear sister sent. Her name is Andrea, and uh, she has a condition, and she's not able to be with us uh, any Sundays, any services, but she's probably the most faithful attendee here because every Sunday after every sermon I preach, she's the first one to send me a text. She's bedridden, but she's always watching, and she's been watching all of this. From your lecture in the morning, all the way up until now, she's the, the one of the most faithful people here. And uh, she she wrote this, and I wanted to end this with, it, it, it's very encouraging probably for you and for everyone who took your time. She says, hello, I do not have a question per se, only to say that I am new to the reform and understanding true Christianity, I have loved God all my life, but was raised under traditions and practices through the Roman Catholic Church. Because of this, it's been a long journey and under, to understand what discipleship is and to really put the word into practice. So I have a lot to learn and I'm still repainting and trying to be a better person. So it's hard for me at this point to be the best example. All I know is that I have a true love for God and a long way to go. I know I will get there, and I'm doing my best to follow good examples. Now, through the reform, and put in practice what I'm learning. Thank you, God bless, and thank you for being with us. Amen. Amen. I think she speaks for all of us. Amen.
Steve, why don't you close us out in prayer and thank you once again for all the time you spent with us. It's been my pleasure. And thank you, Father, for those very things, for the impact you've had on that sister as she's gotten to know your word better, the impact you've had on my life, David's life, and everyone here who has taken your word seriously, the changes you brought about, the joy and the peace that comes from knowing the truth and the freedom. I thank you, Father, that we can be lifelong learners. And I hope we will be. Father, I pray that we will never decide that we now understand everything and don't have anything more to learn. What a boring remainder of our life there would be if we learn nothing new. I pray that you'll make us avid seekers of truth, lovers of truth, and humble acceptors of truth when that truth is unflattering to us or something we would rather not hear. Because you have the right to tell us what we don't want to hear. And you are the King and the Lord. And we pray that we will always and evermore be informed and obedient in your service so that we might accomplish yes. in our short lifetimes, each of us, the thing that you actually had in mind for us to accomplish for your kingdom's sake. I pray for each one here, Father, that your spirit will convict each one to take you seriously, to take Jesus seriously, to reject the option of being lukewarm or apathetic, but to be challenged to study your word with a mind to learn your will so that we might do it. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for being here. Please read Steve Gregg's book, Empire of the Risen Sun. And if you don't have a copy uh, and you want to attain one, talk to me after the service and we'll discuss how we can put one in your hands. God bless you. Go and sin no more. <laughs>